Good afternoon friends, welcome to this easy EduSec live lecture. Dear friends, we would like to tell you all that in this session today, we would be talking on an important topic and the topic of today's discussion is environmental history, exploring relationship between social sciences and natural sciences. And for this very discussion, we have once again with us in our studios, Dr. Mayan Kumar. Dr. Mayan Kumar is Associate Professor in Satyabati College Evening, Delhi University. So let's welcome Dr. Mayan Kumar and let's uh, try to find relationship between the natural sciences and social sciences. Hello, sir. Welcome to the Edith Set Lecture. Thank you, Gitka. Thank you very much. Uh, now, the today's topic, as Gitika has told you, environmental history, exploring relationships between social sciences and natural sciences. The reason for uh, this particular topic is that the domain of history has been expanding over the last 50 years. And in what ways environmental history, which has emerged in recent decades, recent two decades, is trying to borrow from natural sciences and social sciences to discuss or to understand past in its various manifestations. Environmental history, which is trying to bridge the gap between sciences and social sciences. What has been happening is that we all have been, we all, uh, not only historian, political scientists, social scientists, biologists, botanists, we all have been victim of our own discipline. We have been uh, captured by the concerns, by the tools, by the methodologies of our own disciplines. So we don't uh, really interact with other disciplines. Environmental history, as I've been practicing that uh, discipline, uh, a sub-discipline of history, environmental history tries to bring uh, a kind of link between science and social sciences. The reason is that uh, uh, we deal with the uh, history of environment. And to understand environment and its complexities, we need to borrow extensively from the researches which have been conducted by natural scientists. Why it is important? Simply because the historians have been, uh, uh, historians have based their arguments or their research on the basis of various records which are available, which have been written. But these records basically pertain to archival document, which is government document, epigraphics, epigraphic evidences, epigraphs, which are basically created by the elite of the society or by the state. Similarly, we also uh, depend a lot on the literary sources. But what happens, all these have been focusing primarily on humans and the concerns of human and the, uh, the, the, the cultural, ritual, religious, social, political practices of humans. Environmental history tries to go beyond these uh, preliminary boundaries of history and tries to suggest that, the, 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 uh, try to understand, tries to make an attempt to understand the role of uh, nature. In what ways environment has been influencing humans or as for the recent past we can say or in what ways humans have been interacting, have been influencing, have been trying to intervene or changing the course of nature. In both ways, what we are trying to understand is that interaction between humans and nature, which means to understand the nature we need to borrow extensively from the discipline of various natural sciences. It may be physics, it can be chemistry, it can be biology, it can be geology, it can be uh, astronomy, etc., etc. So all these disciplines have been researching on the past of environment. Botanist, in what ways plants have evolved, what has been their history, in what ways plants have been modified, what have been the role of human intervention in the uh, functioning of plant or a particular landscape. So all these are being done by the botanist, the, uh, the zoologist. They have been documenting the fauna of the region. While attempting that, they have been also trying to document and they have witnessed the impact of human society on the zoology, on, on, on the fauna of the region, which means they have been working on various manifestations of human impact on flora or fauna, etc., etc. Similarly, in what ways we have been modulating the the, 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 uh, the contours of landscape, 
we create dams, we flatten the uh, forest, we flatten the hills, we create highways, we cut across the ridges, we cut across the mountains, we bridge the river, which means we have been changing the course of various natural manifestations of nature, which means the, uh, the landscape, river is, uh, the course of river is changed, the forests are eliminated, which means the natural scientists have been documenting in what ways humans have been influencing the nature. Unfortunately, historians have usually neglected these research. And environmental history is an area where we have to extensively borrow from the knowledge which has been created by the natural science. So, today what I am trying to do is to offer you the, the, the nature of relationship between social sciences and natural sciences and in what ways these relationships have been evolving over a period of time. It must also be uh, mentioned at the very beginning that it is not that that only historians or only social scientists have been benefiting from the uh, insights developed by the natural scientists. We also, let me also very categorically state that even the natural sciences have been benefited from the researches conducted by the historians conducted by the social scientists, which means there has been interdependence. I will be discussing that interdependence later on in the uh, second part of my lecture. At the moment, let me, let me begin by suggesting that there are histories of environment and there are environmental history, which means histories of environment is history of environment. When I say environmental history, then it is the impact or, or interaction of humans with the environment. That phase of evolution of earth is, man, is manifest, is, is documented in the environmental history. So, there is a very clear cut distinction in the uh, history of environment and environmental history. And in no way, I am going to claim any, any knowledge of or any uh, expertise on the history of environment. I am not going to do that. What I am going to do is that what in histories of environment have been providing evidences for our understanding of environmental history. Histories of environment is in the domain of geologists, it is in the domain of botanists, paleobotanists, similarly zoologists, etc., etc. There are new multiple disciplines who have been working on the histories of environment. Then if you go to history of earth, then you come to astronomy also and how they have been exploring the origin of earth itself, origin of cosmos itself and the problems related with that. I am not going to deal with that. But what I am trying to do definitely is that borrow from their insights to understand our own society. In what ways the past society's interaction with the environment, with the nature can be uh, better comprehended by the insights developed by the scientist. So, which means the environmental histories is basically a uh, history of human interaction with the nature. The second issue which is very important for me to discuss in the beginning is that there are social scientists and there are natural scientists. There is a distinction between the social scientist and natural scientist. I am not saying that it is a very hard and fast, but I am trying to suggest that the tools used by both the disciplines are very, very different and that is why they are termed as social scientists and natural scientists. Secondly, and very important is that social scientist which deals with the society, aspects of society, manifestation of society does not have the liberty of conducting experiments which natural scientists have been doing. They have this uh, facility, this uh, possibility that they can explore the past, they can explore various dimensions of nature by experimenting with it, whereas social scientists we do not have that liberty. We have to understand the way it has been done. That is why the, the concerns are different and the tools which, 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 with which we are trying to understand that is also very, very different. Perhaps one of the reasons is that the social, scientists, social sciences and natural sciences have been oscillating between a specific to universal or universal to particular. What I am trying to suggest that natural scientists are looking for evidences of universal laws. In what ways universal features, universal uh, manifestations are important, which means they move from a specific to universal and then they try to generalize in what ways it can be explained which has universal validity. This is not the concern of the 
social scientists. Social scientists are basically interested in the specificities in the particular simply because it is this particular which defines the, defines the character of a particular society, of a particular culture, of a particular political formations or economic conditions. Which means we cannot give you universal laws because it, the particular is very, very important in uh, social sciences, uh, sciences. Which means the concerns of historian, concerns of social scientists and concerns of scientists widely differ but they also interact with each other. Secondly, social scientists are and they cannot offer universal laws of applicability because every society has its own dynamics. It is conditioned by the time and space, at what time it has emerged and in what location. That location, that space notion is basically environment. And environmental history, while trying to understand that landscape, the importance of the space has been borrowing from natural sciences because the space has been documented by the natural scientists. Secondly, I have mentioned this earlier also in, 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 uh, in one of the lecture here, uh, environmental history introduction part 1 and introduction part 2. What I have uh, discussed there is that we must understand this uh, conflict of uh, universal to particular and particular to universal has been uh, conditioned by our tools. Environmental historians, when they work on the past, we have to understand the landscape of that area. While understanding that landscape, we need to understand the geology of that area, what is the waterscape, what are the forests, and in what ways these natural resources have been appropriated by the human society. And in what ways these differ from one region to another region. Because that difference makes it very, very important for us to understand the context in which particular society has evolved. Secondly, we cannot and we should not try to universalize because the conditions are different. The availability of resources differ from one region to another region. Even within India, it differs a lot. It is very, very diverse. For example, the monsoon. Monsoon so it covers almost whole of India, varies from one region to another region. Certain regions receive excessive rains, certain regions receive very less rain. Certain season region, uh, regions receive it in the month of uh, July to September, certain regions receive the monsoon rain in the month of December and January, which means naturally the process can be explained that it is. Uh, shift or in the direction of the river, uh, in the direction of air flow which leads to creation of monsoon. But monsoon at what time it reaches a particular region and what are the impact of it are very, very different. We cannot universalize its impact on the societies. We can say that the functioning can be explained in terms of universal laws. The, uh, the, the pattern of river change, uh, the pattern of air flow changes from ocean it turns back to land that is universally acceptable. But what happens after that in what ways it influences, impacts and comprehended by the societies is different and that differs a lot. That is also very important because the space where we are trying to locate our understanding, so scientists try, uh, try to do that. While doing that, they need to understand the impact of human activities on flora and fauna. Similarly, the influences of natural surroundings on humans. It is both way, it is two way interaction which we have been trying to document, which we are trying to understand. This is very, very important simply because when we say that we are borrowing from the tools of natural sciences, what we are trying to say is that we need to understand even their understanding of nature has been changing. What I mean by that? Most of the time, most of the time we have been believing that nature has been like this since ancient past. No, it has changed. It has changed, it is changing and it will change. This notion of stationary or the staticness is very, very problematic. Nature has evolved, nature has changed, earth has evolved, which means even for the natural scientist, things were not the same as they are today. 
they have evolved, which means even natural scientists are trying to document that process of change. That is understanding the past of the change which has happened in recent past, which means even they are venturing into the past of environment. And environmental historians is also venturing into the past of environment, but with a specific reference to human societies and the humans. Equally important is the acceptance of variability at the moment. When we challenge the stationarity, we also need to understand the variability is inherent part, inherent characteristic of any society. If it is a characteristic of any society, then it is also characteristic of any environment. It has changed, it will change. We all are aware of ice age, interglacial period, little ice age, another interglacial period, another ice age, etc., etc. Which means there is a vi uh, variability is inherent in any, any social or political or natural formation. This variability is very, very important for us to comprehend simply because our reaction, uh, our relationship, our interaction with the nature changes with the variation in the nature itself. I am not talking about seasonal or annual variations, which means there are summer, then the winter, then the rains, summer, winter, rains. That is cyclic pattern. There are patterns which are not even cyclic, but which cut across uh, all these factors like the beginning of interglacial period or the beginning of ice age or the beginning of little ice age, etc., etc. These are not, these are natural, but not, but not comprehensible by humans in an easy manner. It is not, the changes are not visible in the one's lifetime. You need to go beyond one's lifetime. And at that moment of time, the natural science becomes very important for us to understand. Similarly, the significance of adaptability needs to be understood. It is the challenge, we need to challenge the stationarity, we have to accept the variability and we need to understand the significance of adaptability. It is adaptability which has ensured human survival. Had there been no adaptability, we would have perished. This capacity of humans to adapt to the changes, to change according to the situation is very, very important concern of environmental historians because the nature has changed impacting the social formation, political formation, economic formation, they are changing. So, we are trying to map changes at both the level, at the, at the, at the natural level as well as the social level, which means environmental historian is struggling with two liquid phenomena, two liquid propositions, two though very fluid propositions. The nature is also changing and the social formations which is based on those natural conditions is also changing. I am not yet discussing industrial revolution and its impact. I am not yet discussing the globalization. I am simply suggesting that all these have changed our interaction with environment, our understanding of environment. Interaction between different part of globe, the northern part of America, the southern part of India, two very different climate. But at both these places, humans have survived. It is this, this capacity to adapt to these diverse conditions, to changes that has been important consideration for natural scientists to document, to understand. Similarly, we also need to understand that there is no harmony in nature. There is no balance in nature. It is very problematic proposition. The balance or harmony is uh, now challenged is not no more acceptable to us simply because the, uh, the balance means stationarity that there is a very ideal position. Every position is ideal and every position is not ideal because depending upon one situation, situation will become ideal depending upon one's own location, tools, capacity, status, etc. It may be ideal, it may not be ideal. Let me cite Daniel Botkins, the moon in the nutless shell, discordant harmony is reconsidered. In this uh, book, he says that the balance of nature does not exist, there is no balance and perhaps has never existed. The number of wild animals are constantly varying to a greater or lesser extent and the variations are usually irregular in period and always irregular in amplitude. 
each variation in the number of one species causes direct and indirect repercussions on the number of the others that is the level of interdependence and since many of the latter are themselves independently varying in numbers the resultant confusion is remarkable which means the nature has been changing flora fauna has been changing and since it has been changing we need to understand the change and environmental historians are making preliminary investigation in the in the era of changes or in the variability along with this we also try to document human intervention human influences impact on human etc etc with these varying conditions which means environmental historian is trying to understand society in its fluidity in its transition transition which is inherent part of any civilization any society it is impossible uh, to believe that there, is, uh, there has been any society which has been static the societies have evolved it will keep on evolving any minor or major variation in the climatic pattern will force the societies to change or to adapt to the changed condition which means even human uh, social system has been very very fluid and we need to understand that this can be explained primarily or uh, uh, basically basically in the concerns of environmental historians our concern has been political concerns economic history social history feminist perspective history of marginals dalit etc and ecological concerns which means historians have been trying to focus on political issues economic issues social history feminist perspective etc etc when they do this they are also trying to understand the changes the changes which have been documented at different level by the natural scientists themselves i am not going to details of political concerns economic concerns and social concerns of uh, historians but i would like to discuss a bit on feminist perspective as well as history of marginal and dalits and ecological concerns simply because these three are uh, uh, have been an important intervention in the historical studies the feminist the history of marginals as well as the ecological concern all these three have modulated the nature of society the nature of history itself when i say feminist feminist perspective what i mean to say is that usually it has been said that there is no history of women because it is not recorded it's not available she was there a lady was there but they does not figure in the historical documents that does not mean that it was not in existence or there was no role being played by the women it just that the writer who was writing for that period does not take cognizance of this section of society why there are multiple reasons for that and multiple explanations for that but one of the primary primary reason has been that the primary unit of family has been the son uh, a person his son or daughter his wife etc etc which means the the concerns of historian shifting towards women was much later phenomena simply because it was said that there is no record which have any evidences of history of female history of women but historians have worked on various kind of sources which have directly or indirectly documented the status of women and then they have given a feminine perspective or a feminist perspective of uh, history itself i'm not discussing at the moment environmental history simply because even in environmental history a lot has been contributed by perspective on or shifting our gaze on women then we get the another picture or very different picture of environmental history which we have been doing in other dimensions other major concern has been history of marginals or dalits when we say marginals or dalit we can examine them in terms of political deprivations we can discuss that in economic deprivation we can discuss that in economic uh, social discrimination but this is another dimension to it that is ecological impact or impact of ecology on the marginal sections of society this becomes very very clear if i cite only two examples the first example is 
the river valley civilizations, uh, the multi-purpose river valley projects, which were basically implemented in river valley civilizations. These multi-purpose river valley projects have been basically examined in terms of their economic consideration, their technological viability. What they have been ignoring is that these minor sections themselves have a history and their relationship with history uh, with the environment is different from a middle class interaction with the environment. The interaction is different from the an upper caste interaction with the environment. This difference, this change is very, very important for us to understand because when we say history of marginals or delis, etc., what we are trying to do is that give voice to the section which has been voiceless. I have used a concept, a uh, term form in my, uh, in my one of my chapter is basically trying to document visibly invisible. Environment is all pervasive, it is everywhere. So, it is visible. It is visible, but not yet visible. This visible invincibility, in, uh, invisibility, invisibility of environment is uh, another unique feature with which historians have been struggling. I do not know uh, about the few books which are available or not here, but there are books which have been documenting these changes. In the same context, the last but not the least concern of the historians has been ecological concern. When I say ecological concern, it means the concern for ecology. And in India, we can say that very emphatically, simply because in India, most of the early generation of environmental history have been journalists, have been social activists, which means they have given their own interpretation of ecological concerns. Along with this, we also have a version by the state, version by from the those who have, those who can afford that, which means ecological concerns have been gaining importance in the historical narrative. While doing this, while approaching this kind of understanding, what we have been trying to understand is that that invisible section may be made visible. It may be provided with the voice through which it can interact. Invisibly, in, invisibly visible is that it is there, but it is so all pervasive that societies felt no need to document it. Mere unavailability of document does not mean in any manner that there was no history of environment or environmental history cannot be written. Simply because if it is not being written, it is the primary reason has been our focus is not on the these issues. Let me give you another example. Any marriage, any marriage party in Delhi or in your area, most of the male will be wearing the suit. They have evolved to this, they have adapted to this change. But what about the peasant who is working in the field? Who is working in the field almost 24 hours to give you better food? which means the ecological concern needs to focus its uh, concern or its focus on those issues which have been uh, placed in the margins of traditional historical understanding. These ecological concerns are also important because we may be prepared to adapt to new kind of changes which are almost eminent, which are almost eminent with the uh, uh, impact of climate change or the global warming, which means we need to be socially aware of the process of adaptation and in what ways are we going to negate, manage the, uh, the, the changes or the process of adaptability, which means ecological concerns which historians have been trying to document is basically trying to understand the process of adaptability as well as the the method to mitigate the hardship which is imminent by the change in the climate or the global warming. The global warming in itself is a highly contested issue. We will be discussing that later on in my second part of this lecture. But at the moment, let me simply mention that the invisibility, the invisibility has to be challenged, has to be made visible and this can be done, has been 
successfully done by the environmental history. They have been giving voice to, they have been giving, uh, throwing fresh light on the environment of the past to make us understand the importance of climate variability as well as process of adaptability. Thank you friends, we will have a break of 5 minutes and we'll come back and discuss the other implications of human nature interaction with a specific reference to environmental history. Thank you very much. Afternoon, friends. Once again, uh, let me continue my lecture on the uh, relationship between sciences and social sciences, and in what ways environmental history has been a link between these two uh, disciplines, and why it is important uh, to link these two disciplines, natural sciences as well as social sciences. I have been discussing the impact, uh, the, the climate variability, stationarity, how they have been uh, important consideration for the social scientist as well as the natural scientist. Uh, and I have been also trying to say that the natural scientists uh, have been uh, looking for, they have been looking for an universal laws governing the nature, explanation which can be testified, which can be experimented once again and prediction of future path based on the past experiences, which means when they venture into past, they have been trying to document two things. One, the process of change. Second, in what ways in the process of change humans have adapted to. When they come into this uh, exploration of documenting the human interaction with the past, environmental historians become handy to them. They offer insight to them simply because uh, the, the natural scientist does not understand or they are, it is difficult for them to understand the, uh, the specificities of social relationship, the specificities of economic and political relationships and that is where so, uh, social scientists have been playing their role. What is being happening is that we both are uh, interacting with each other so that both are benefiting. This interdependence was very uh, beautifully explained by uh, Emmanuel Laduri in his classic book, Times of Feast, Times of Famine, A History of Climate since the year 1000. And he says that when metrologists, geologists and biologists wanted to find out the climate of the 11th and 16th century, they invited a dozen rural and economic historians to their meeting and they interested in them the task of establishing most of the series for the periods concerned. The historians having brought along with them the continuous annual quantitative homogeneous list of figures which the scientists had need of. So, the relationship between the history of climate and related disciplines involve a fruitful exchange, a constant flow of information in both the directions. History of climate, when historians were working on that, they wanted to verify their results. They wanted to verify the, 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 the validity of their experiments or their formulations. For that, they required so, scientists, historians who have been working on past societies to verify their findings and only when it was verified on the basis of social evidences that they believed that their tools are good. 
they are doing what they have been meant for. This is interdependence and this interdependence is massive, tremendous interdependence. Most of the time we are not even aware of its interdependence, but we have been borrowing that. That interdependence was uh, in another uh, manner was explained by Richard Grove and John Chappell when they were working on process of changes which are manifested in the monsoons. And they say that it makes sense as historical records have the advantage of delineating the social and economic impacts of extreme climate events and passages with which physical and biological record recorders of climates such as coral growth, band or trees ring series cannot do. Similarly, it is easier said than done as verification by the historian is not an easy task in the absence of coherent historical records of past societies. What I am trying to suggest is that the scientist, <coughs> the tools which they are using has its own limitation. Similarly, the tools which we have been using as a social scientist, as a historian has its own limitations. <coughs> and by clubbing the tools of each other, we are at times able to overcome that limitation. <coughs> the limitations which has been inhibiting growth of natural sciences in particular direction may be overcome by the insights offered by the social scientists or the historians. Similarly, the social scientists when they are unable to understand at times it is, this, it, it is the scientific explanation or scientific understanding of particular natural processes which makes them aware of its importance and then its impact on the human society. So, it is, it is it's a dual way, it is a both way that we have been seeing an interaction between sciences and social sciences especially in the case of environmental history. This is particularly important simply because <coughs> The natural sciences have been trying to, especially the biological sciences have been trying to document the evolution. Along with evolution, deviations and the exceptions, which means there is no continuous evolution. There have been deviations, there have been uh, uh, exceptions, there have been aberration in the process of evolution, which we have understood as a very natural, monolithic, universal phenomena. No, the evolution is there. But the rate of speed, the, 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 the rate of change is different, the process of evolution is different and when you figure humans into it and the human society into it, then this evolution changes because it is specific to societies, cultural values, social values, political system, economic uh, conditions, etc, etc. So, while documenting the evolution and devi deviations and the exceptions, the biological sciences have been providing a map of past climate, a map of past landscape, which offer a platform for environmental historians to work upon. That is possible only with only when there is interaction between uh, science and the social science. If there is no interaction, this will not be useful. Moreover, at times, so scientists does not have explanation why it is happening, what happened and then the science helps in that this is what has happened which has which historians have seen or so scientists have seen manifested in social, economic, etc, etc domains. Physical sciences similarly have been searching the variability, changes and continuity. Physical sciences tries to map the, the notion of the process of variability, the changes and the continuities. And in all these processes, what they are trying to do is that to understand the complexities of physical sciences. As a social scientist, we have been also trying to do, uh, we, we are also trying to understand the variability, changes and continuity in the social formation, in the political formations, in the society at large. We are well aware that there is variability, we are well aware that there, is, there are changes and along with changes we also many, see manifestation of continuity, which means the physical sciences, the quest is almost same which is available with the or which is the concern of the social scientist. The difference is that their tools are different and our tools are different, our methods are different and their methods are different. I am not suggesting that I may get training as a biologist, 
I do not want to be trained as a like as a zoologist, but I would definitely like to borrow from their insights. The food habits of flora, uh, food habits of fauna, the food habits of various animals is important for humans to understand if they are trying to understand a particular society. In what ways human societies in past were living with various kind of flora, uh, various kind of fauna, only if you are able to understand the food habits, the, the, the habits of fauna of that area which sciences have been trying to do. A very, very, very easy example can be the process of domestication of animals, which leads to beginning of, uh, in a way, contributes to the beginning of uh, in the uh, Neolithic Revolution. So, the domestication of animal is one of the method through which you can understand that the humans have been changing the natural settings. The animals which were wild were gradually uh, domesticated you all are aware of the domestication of plant life, so that agriculture can begin. So, that is one dimension, but in, in, in both directions we have been trying to understand the evolution, deviations and exceptions. This becomes all the more important when we look at the concerns of historian on one hand, so scientists on one hand and the scientists on another hand. This is particularly important when we tend to see the importance of scientists when they try to propose policy formulations, when they suggest that in what ways policy should move forward. While doing that, they need to borrow extensively, extensively they borrow from the concerns of social sciences. The societal concerns influences their understanding. This is very clearly applicable when we understand the process of conservation. While conservation is proposed, there can be very hard positions taken by the so, uh, natural scientists which says that um, there should not be any intervention, any interaction of humans with the nature. It must be out of bound for the humans, but then they are made aware that this is the region where the humans have been living since ancient past, since very remote past they have been living in harmony with the environment etcetera, etcetera, which means you cannot propose something radical which eliminates the human interaction with environment. So, these policy formulations by the scientists is basically modulated by or conditioned by the social concerns. Similarly, most of the inventions are useful, but there are inventions which are not socially viable. So, social viability of scientific formulation is also very important. It is not possible that all which is applicable in a, in a lab can be implemented outside in the world, simply because the viability is very, very important. Let me give you an example. Most of the river valley civilizations, ancient river valley civilizations have been were primarily dependent on copper and bronze. They are known as bronze age civilizations, because they were not yet able to master the art of iron smelting. When iron becomes, imp uh, becomes available, we witness a democratic change, because iron is widely dis uh, dispersed uh, various, uh, uh, in the various parts of globe, it is easily available and once you are able to make use of it, you have changed the nature of social formations, which means the copper which was available earlier also, the copper which is easy to melt, which is easy to smelt, which is easy to use does not provide certain kinds of benefits which iron provides. But if it, if iron was not easily available, it would have been useless, because mere introduction of technology is not important. It is the social acceptance, the social applicability of those society, those uh, uh, technological formulations or those scientific formulations are also very important, which means this so science, the scientists have been borrowing from the understanding of so scientists. They are trying to understand the society in which particular kind of technology is to be implemented. If it is not feasible, then it would not be implemented. For example, India is densely populated. So, the kind of development which we require is basically human intensive. 
वेर एज अमेरिका और अदर डेवलप्ड नेशन वेर पॉपुलेशन इज वेरी वेरी लिमिटेड दे वर लुकिंग फॉर साइंटिफिक टूल्स वे लिविंग फॉर साइंसेज विच कैन प्रोवाइड दैम लिबरेशन फ्रॉम देयर डिपेंडेंस ऑन दी ह्यूमन पॉपुलेशन दिस इज डिफरेंट वी कैन नॉट गो फॉर कैपिटल इंटेंसिव टेक्नोलॉजी and they should not go for human intensive technology because they lack human availability and we lack availability of capital so science may propose same thing for both the societies but when it is it has to be implemented then the social context needs to be understood and taken care of this understanding of or this uh, this uh, recognition of change is very very important for social scientists similarly the social applicability of scientific formulation is also very important it's not that one scientific formulation is proposed it will be universally accepted the social acceptability is also very important consideration and this accessibility is most of the time is defined by the level of knowledge and the critical thinking the social acceptability of scientific formulation is also very important because in evolving societies various kind of superstitions take place and we tend to ignore the importance of scientific formulations which means the social acceptability of scientific formulation is also very important but there are dilemmas dilemmas for environmental historians dilemmas for anybody who is trying to become a link between natural sciences and social sciences simply because their tools are different and their concerns are different though at a deeper analysis they seems to converge uh, to a great extent dilemmas and once again i am borrowing from the daniel botkins book it says that we interact with nature in two ways rationally and through an inner personal non intellectual response and that is the difference we have been interacting them with the nature with very rational mindset we are rational and there is another dimension to it that is we also interact with the nature as a on very personal level on very non intellectual uh, level what we understand what we love about the nature we try to accept that without a uh, uh, putting any question mark on that or without raising any doubt on that which means there is a rational understanding of environment of landscape and then there is a non intellectual response very personal which is modulated by the personal relationship with the nature what happens is that the inner personal non intellectual includes in the larger sense all that is outside of rationality our folk ways our myths our spiritual feelings that arise from deep within us our religious sensitivities both ways of interacting with nature are important however we got ourselves into trouble when we confuse the two letting the inner person determine what we tell other ourselves our rational decision and actions and believing that rationality can replace the non rational that we modern are so immersed in the rationality of science and its offsprings modern technology that we don't need don't even have a non rational side of our existence when it comes to nature or our connection with nature is in the issue of global warming simply one of the signs and therefore of rationality very purely very uh, narrowly if i try to define then the issue of global warming is a concern of scientist of natural scientist but we know the the, the responses the interaction the processes can not be implemented unless we take on board the social scientist mere change documentation of change is not important what is important is that intervention in the way humans have been interacting with the uh, environment it is all the more important simply because we have changed the notion of landscape this is also important because when we say that the context is different then that context needs to be explained global warming affects different society different parts of globe differently that impact even within a society varies from one section of society to another section of society i am not at questioning i am not at questioning the 
formulations on which the global warming has been proposed. I will be doing that in a, in a few minutes. But at the moment, let me simply focus on the impact of global warming is different from different sections of society in different parts of globe. Which means, though climate warming, uh, warming is a universal phenomena, mitigation requires extensive intervention on the part of social scientists. Because only then you can tell them, only, only then they can be made aware of the uh, situation where they need to change their methods, they need to change their understanding of societies. It is also important because these formulations of global warming are based on past experiences. Past experiences where variability is one component and adaptability is equally important, but secondary consideration of uh, scientific investigation. When we are able to document the adaptations, we will be able to better in a, in a better position to comprehend the changes and its impact and how to mitigate it. These climate models are basically uh, steady state models and that is what I have been trying to argue since beginning that the climate varies. There is a tremendous variability in the climate. Landscape has been non-stationary. It is not stationary, it is not static, it has changed, it has been changing. If that is the case, if that is the case, so CGMs which are basically used by societies to understand the climate variability, to understand the global warming and its impact tend to make a major mistake that most of these, body, these formulations are steady state models, which means they are based on the data which is static for them. For last 30 years, what has been the precipitation, uh, what has been uh, daily temperature variation and the lowest and the highest, etcetera, etcetera. It changes with the human intervention in a particular region, which means these, the, the, these climate models have their own limitations. Though they have provided us a broad understanding of climate change and its impact, but when we try to implement the formulations, the suggestions made by uh, uh, economists is difficult to understand simply because we are still not very comfortable, we are not able to understand the importance of climate variability in understanding the climate. These CGS, CGMs when described by once again Neil Botkin and he says that none of these steady state assumptions are true, none of these are true. A species do not come into instance equilibrium with a new climate. There are always in the process of responding to previous environmental change. These, there are factors that limit distribution that are changing over time. Individual populations, a species have the capability to adjust to a changing environment or otherwise they all would have gone extinct in past which means he is trying to suggest that there has been no equilibrium. This is very problematic formulation. Today we are look, looking for equilibrium simply because we have understood that unless we are able to maintain equilibrium, it will lead to mass destruction. It may lead to a massive destruction of flora and fauna, which means the, 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 the capacity of Society to change, to adapt is very, very important. In this climate change model, what has also been proposed is that uh, interaction with the climate uh, varies from one person to another person, one uh, group of society to another group of society, one section of society with the other sections of society. CGH, CGMs, climate, uh, G, G, sorry, GCMs. Uh, the global climate models are basically scientific formulations. But before implementation, they need its verification by the social scientist, which means these GCMs, which are almost universally applicable, needs to understand the process of adaptability which society has shown or which society can show or which is lacking in a society. 
So, GCMs on the one hand provide various evidences of changes in the climatic pattern that is there equally good, but to make policy on the basis of that is a difficult uh, proposition simply because impact differs from region to region, from society to society and from context to context. This scientific understanding also put stress on the climate on the history on environmental historians simply because the environment is being documented from various dimensions and all those dimensions are not it is it is almost beyond capability of one human being to document all these changes and then write a environmental history but that is where significance lies the strength lies Environmental history is interdisciplinary. It cut across various disciplines. So much so, it does not venture only in the domain of social sciences, but it also ventures into the domain of social sciences. So, this interdisciplinary is very, very important for us to understand because that is the strength of environmental history. Environmental history is all encompassing. In a way, it is quite similar to total history which was proposed by Analysis School. So, it is all encompassing. In what ways? Elimination of one species, elimination of one plant, elimination of one portion is directly related to the other portion. So, there is a uh, interdependence and that is the strength of environmental history. It is all encompassing and there are micro and macro impacts. There are micro and macro impacts which environmental historians try to document and which are useful for natural scientists as well. Which means the strength of environmental history is basically in its interdisciplinary, it is all encompassing, a very comprehensive treatment of society, its nature, its landscape, and the micro and macro impacts. Elimination of uh, dinosaurs is a macro impact elimination of one of these species is a micro impact. So, it has been changing and it will change. What I have been trying to do is that to offer you a relationship, offer, a, offer you a glimpse to the relationship between natural sciences and social sciences through the uh, insights developed by the environmental historians. I have just given you the strength. Now, let me also briefly discuss the limitations the climate is visibly invisible. Visibly invisible means it is out there, we can see that, but we do not get evidences, recorded evidences of climate in our past information. That is the problem of the historical sources. Secondly, the global the environmental history deals with the complex issues and these complexities create problem for a very simple straightforward narrative of environment. Equally important is to understand the cause and effect is problematic. This has happened, so this will happen. This cannot be said about the physical sciences. You can say it about the social sciences, but for physical sciences this cannot be argued that uh, the cause and effect is directly proportionate to each other. And please understand there is no one to one relationships. There is no one to one relationship. If I cut a tree, which means the supply of oxygen will diminish. No, it is not all that simple. When you cut a tree, the tree is borrowed from the peasant of your village who cooks food. The tree is borrowed to the village itself from which that peasant belongs and then it is used for the last, last rites, etc., etc. But that is why there is no one to one relationship. The relationship is very, very diverse and very, very uh, dynamic. That needs to be understood. And, and in this process, natural sciences have been helping the social scientists to understand because they have been documenting changes, the changes which are visible at multiple level. Let me also share before I conclude bibliographies for your ready reference. These are two uh, pages, one is uh, stationary is dead, then it is covered in harmony, Jared Diamond's collapse, how societies choose to fail or succeed. Uh, Mayank Kumar's book Monsoon Ecologies. I have also listed for your uh, for your reference uh, Mag John Neal's very important book 
uh, something new under the sun. It's a very, very important book. Similarly, Fagan's The Great Warming and The Little Ice Age talks about historical past where climate variability was documented by environmental historians. So these are the uh, references which are available for your reading reference and will be available for uh, later use as well. Thank you, Gitka. With this note, thank you, sir. Thank you so very much. And dear friends, yes, we believe that these lectures are very, very beneficial for you. So if you feel so that uh, these lectures have added benefit to you, you can uh, uh, give your feedback to us at info.cc at the rate nic dot in. We would be meeting again soon and would be discussing on another topic. Till then, take care. Goodbye. Thank you, sir. Thank you so very thank much. Thank you very much.